Hi. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> it is the unrestricted section, take two of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, chapters 20 through 25. We are the podcast that must not be named for real this time. And we are joined here with Jem from the podcast Nine and Three Quarters. Hello. Welcome again. Thank you. I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little it's embarrassed. Incredibly stressful. <laughs> Well, welcome, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. Can you tell people a little bit about how you got involved in Harry Potter and what you do in this little community of ours? Yeah, so I've been a fan for like ever. Um, I'm only 21, so I was sort of raised with the books and movies. Um, and my sister and I, about over a year ago, decided to start a podcast where we talked about Harry Potter so we wouldn't annoy our friends and family by doing it in public. So we just talk amongst ourselves. Um and we just try and answer as many questions as we can about how the series works and how the world works in general. But it's uh, explicit content, adults only. <laughs> so <laughs> kids probably wait a few years for listening to it. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting, Luke. We, we found the Australian versions of us. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we sounds... literally started the show for the exact same reason. <laughs> Well, don't you know, like, everyone in the Northern Hemisphere has the exact opposites in the Southern Hemisphere, so that's how it it's works. It's so nice to meet you. <laughs> it's like that or Star Trek me. episode where everyone, they, they, <laughs> they have the uh, alternate dimension. There's a different, there's a, a copy of everyone out there. So, yeah, that, that's our yeah. science fiction version of uh, the Harry Potter community. It's a, it's a hemispheric thing. Mm. A mirror verse, as yeah. one of our yes. friends, Alicia, in the... Um, chat just throughout there. So I appreciate that. Just so you know, all of our listeners, you are hearing this either live on YouTube or you are hearing it on Patreon at patreon.com slash stay imaginary, where this unrestricted section is available for all of our Patreon listeners. If you are not a Patreon listener, please go to patreon.com slash stay imaginary and join our legion because you can get access to this and any other of our content from all of our shows at the family, the podcast that family. All right. Does everybody have their signed permission slip to be in the unrestricted section from their favorite professor? Yeah, Smarmy Lucard yeah. signed mine. Of course he did. <laughs> Je oh, okay. See, now we can be friends. Mine is signed by McGonagall as well. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Mm -hmm. So we're going to jump on in. We are discussing any and all content throughout the entire series related to Chapter 21, The House Elf Liberation Front, Chapter 22, The Unexpected Task, Chapter 23, The Yule Ball, Chapter 24, Rita Skeeter Scoop, and Chapter 25, The Egg and the Eye. So, Jem, let's, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and just throw it at you. Is there anything that stood out to you in these first, these couple of chapters that you came in going, man, I really like this, or I really want to talk about this particular idea? Yeah. Okay. So I, I sort of have it chronologically. Um, Excellent. So in chapter 21, when we find out that Harry still has like the miniature dragon that he was given for the first task. Mm -hmm. And I just really, I love that. And I was thinking, what kind of miniature animal would you guys want to have <laughs> as like a little, little friend? <laughs> Hmm. Well, I feel awesome. like I know, especially with the Fantastic Beasts movies that have come out and have really opened up the world. Yeah, like I want a Niffler. Just It'll in destroy your house, <laughs> but in miniature. I have children; they already do that. <laughs> that's yeah, that's true. that. That's that's nothing, that's and I have life. nothing to value because I have children, so I'm good. Um, Fair enough. A miniature version. I mean, I like the idea of the miniature dragon, to be honest. Yeah. I like it how in, actually, I think it's the sixth movie, we see it, like, blowing on popcorn and making <laughs> popcorn. Like, that's such a good yeah. use. <laughs> they or actually like, have a, get, a practical use, right? Like, that, that seems yeah. pretty well, useful. And I get cold a lot. Like, I'm sitting here now, and I'm in a hotel room, so I don't have, like, my extra blankets or you know, jackets or whatever. So if I had it with me, I could like blow it on my toes, which are a little chilly mm. at the moment, you know, like just a little toasty, warm up the blanket <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, yeah. a safe distance. But yeah, yeah, no, I think I like the miniature dragon. How about you? Um, I mean, I could get like a miniature Snape and drown it in a toilet, but oh. I think I'd want something that I would enjoy. So maybe like, I, I, I like the miniature that, dragon. Um, I do like snakes. So maybe like a tiny snake I could just wear like around my finger. Oh, that's kind of cool. Like, hey. Like, it's like, it's got like a ring that moves around, right? It can almost like, yeah. like switch fingers. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Okay, so I have to 
what is your Hogwarts house? Slytherin. <laughs> it wasn't obvious. Which is totally fine. We are all about house equality on this show. Very much. First of all, because while I am a tried and true Ravenclaw, my secondary house is Slytherin. No questions asked. <laughs> that is absolutely yeah. my secondary personality. But like I could tell you're like, you talked about Snape, you talked about snakes. I'm like, well, she's not a Gryffindor, right? <laughs> Gryffindor would never deign to have a snake on their finger. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I love snakes. I'm definitely Slytherin at heart. Probably a Hufflepuff second, to be honest, because then if I could be a Hufflepuff, I'd work really hard to like be the ruler of Huffle Hufflepuff and like because they're such hard workers, they could be yeah. used as like a force. Like <laughs> if they could just if they could just they organize, are. they'd be powerful, right? <laughs> You mean the queen bee? Mm, yeah, I love badges. I actually don't hear too many Hufflepuff Slytherin combinations like that. Oh, doesn't really? happen. I reckon much. they're quite similar. The whole like teamwork thing, hardworking, loyalty to those that are their own. I see like a lot of similarities. Okay, I can buy that. It, mm. You'd be the expert, mm. <laughs> so I, I no, I appreciate that. I just. I haven't heard too many people talk about that combination. It, to me, it's it's. I think it's also because, hey, if you're looking at our experience from Harry's perspective in the movies mm. and books, you don't you don't get those two interacting ever. Yeah. So <laughs> it and there are a few characters that kind of cross over into that. So, I, yeah, no, I, I, I think I get it. But most people who are fans, I don't think I think a lot of people don't admit to be Hufflepuffs when they should because it's a great house. Yeah, same thing with mm. Slytherin. Both have strong, yeah. strong qualities. So if you are one or the other, don't be embarrassed. Let it fly. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Go yeah. ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, it, it's really interesting that your first thing was uh, what kind of figurine would we have? Because one of my notes was, does the dragon figurine ever come back in the book? No, the I don't think so. No. <laughs> It's like, where'd he go? I, like, I mean, we hear about Uncle Vernon's socks from three Christmases ago making their appearance again in the bottom of the um, trunk. Why can I not think? Thank you. Words. Not so much mm. today. In the bottom of the trunk. And then even like in book, what was it? Book seven, when he's cleaning everything out. I am almost positive that dragon figurine is not pretty, laying pretty sure in the not. bottom of that. It, I'm really frustrated by that. I feel like it should be yeah. in there. Maybe right. Dudley like, broke it one summer. He could have used it. Like he could have just dropped it down Umbridge's blouse or something, or like, it thrown like it at someone really, in a jewel. A very practical thing. Like, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I missed opportunities, and I, it was something that, yeah, reading back through this section, I almost didn't remember that he was like just hanging out with it at one point, right? Because he's he's just like, oh, there's the little miniature dragon that's just a part of my yeah. life now. Nope. Harry forgets about it too. Come on, Harry. Come on. Yeah. Uh, poor little dragon figurine and poor little crumb figurine. Little armor yeah. crumb like, figurine. That was disturbing. <laughs> Do they feel things? Because, yikes. Imagine having your arm pulled off. Yeah. That's, uh, That's my question. I was going to say, that was a big one in, in our episode of, like, it, it, it really opens up a lot of questions of magically personified objects, I guess with the portraits, with the action figures. Where do those limitations start and stop on feelings, emotions, AI? Like it, I know we have some information on like the portraits that it's encouraged when you have a portrait made of you that you spend some time with it for a certain amount of time so it can get your mannerisms and be more and more like you, but it's that's like a Pottermore thing. I don't know if you've read into yeah. that. But because you, you look at, you know, a lot of the portraits get used later on by Dumbledore with like the headmasters and they all have like these jobs, but they're not really the headmasters anymore. Like the portrait of Dumbledore is not really him, but it acts like him and has his traits and characteristics and attributes, but it's not really him. So it's the figurines I felt like were a pretty similar concept of magic as well. If this is a toy figurine of Victor Crumb, like... Does it take on some of the attributes and things too? Like, I, I just have questions. They're neat little magic things that get dropped in for texture that then we're the awful fans that are like, that might not make sense. That might not yeah. work. 
maybe it's like same with the portraits so crumb had to spend some time with one of these figurines <laughs> so i could copy his mannerisms and stuff like that's such an awkward marketing thing scheme or maybe it's a bit like ghosts where they're like echoes of a personality they're not actually the person mm-hmm. but then like does he have to spend time i mean at the world cup those figurines there was a lot of them i would assume they were mass produced so is it yeah i'm gonna carve this thing i'm gonna make or make it out of plastic or whatever and, and you spend time with it spend and then time with duplicate the that like a copy so. <laughs> he just has to spend like like a whole month hanging out with a million <laughs> little victors <laughs> that's terrifying <laughs> i'm picturing like the santa claus too with tim allen where they've got like that copy machine where he goes through and then there's like the second santa claus right. like the what is it the big plastic santa claus where he's like i want hot chocolate this is good like only a whole bunch of miniature versions of that just me maybe it's just me i haven't seen santa claus too i'm more thinking like not the museum <laughs> i guess <laughs> ben still and all the little cowboys and, uh... yeah right oh yeah <laughs> but it's a, right. it, it's a really good question and i don't think we're ever gonna get answers which is fine yes i'm sure if you tweet jk she'll answer you with something oh yeah she'll <laughs> she'll get right back to you <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know if I want to know. I like my own head cannon sometimes. She'd be like, they're actually a tiny race of people. That live, like, <laughs> underneath underneath lane four things. of the bowling alley. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Night Vale. Night Vale. There it is. Oh, yes! man. I'm so glad that you got oh, that reference. Oh. <laughs> that was a pretty deep, that was early Night Vale stuff, too. That's a deep cut. It yeah. was. <laughs> of the big Rico's big Rico's bowling pe- alley and oh, that's pe- that's the no, pizza place that's right the pizza place somebody's bowling alley and fun something that's been oh, yeah that's been a love me some night complex, yes 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 that's yeah. what okay oh I'm so happy now I have a question about Snape and, and and obviously you two are going to be so excited about my question so I have a problem with Snape testing poisons on fourth years mm, I do too <laughs> okay not only because he's testing poison on fourth year, so I get it. Okay, that's bad. Whatever. But also, they do that in sixth year with Slughorn. They do a whole, you have to create your own antidote thing. And Harry can't do it, so he runs into the closet and gets a, a Beazor. Mm. So why are they also doing it in fourth year? I think that's just Snape. Like, I think the curriculum asked for it in later years, but Snape's just like, I hate people and I hate this class, so let's do it in an earlier year just to torment Harry Potter. All right, I'm just going to say I think it's cute that you think there's curriculum. I am under a firm belief that they don't have any. (laughs) Okay. Um, Rhea and I actually did a whole episode on this and Hogwarts subjects and the curriculum, and we did find that there was an order to the chaos, but, yeah, I can relate. It does seem like nonsense. (laughs) I have huge issues with the curriculum because that's what I do for a living too. Like, yeah. like I write curriculum and I'm an instructional coach, making sure teachers follow curriculum. I'm not on bridge, although I feel like it's everything like, that you have stated in this I podcast know. has led to me has led me to believe. Wow, Melissa is essentially been asking for umbrage. So when we get there. <laughs> I don't want to hear a peep out of you of, wow, this is too harsh. No, that's what happens when there's nothing and you introduce something. That's what happens yeah. when there's nothing and the government takes over. Yeah, we've, we've, we've made that point for sure. <laughs> it's, I think that's pretty fair too. So, <laughs> I, so I, I just, can we agree that probably this is not an appropriate fourth year activity? Definitely not. It's inappropriate for fourteen-year-olds to be testing poisons. Luke, thoughts? Um, I mean, it, it sounds like it's it's what they're working on. I I really don't like defending Snape at all, but I do think he does have a method to his madness of teaching. Aside from just being cruel and bullying and awful in general, I, I think he typically does take his teaching aspect pretty seriously and he of anybody mcgonagall's the only other one that i'd put this maybe flitwick too um and maybe sprout too we just don't get we don't really get enough classes in theirs to really know their teaching styles very well but he snape is very meticulous to a fault at times and he's also a garbage human being which doesn't help but um (laughs) i think in his if anyone's going to have curriculum, I think it is Snape. I, I think he does follow a 
he sets objectives and gets through them, whether or not the class can handle it or is up to it, he has planned things out for them to be at this point. It's it's their fault if they if they're not keeping up. So the are you saying then that Slughorn's newt level class is too easy? No, I'm saying that's a much more advanced of hey, you have no idea what this poison is. Here is a full lecture on antidotes. This is figure out what the poison is and then come up with the antidote, as opposed to here's the first exposure you have two years before that of this is like the overall idea of here's your poison. Here is a simple antidote that you get to. It's it's okay. it's like the 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 first step in that process of that. The that... progression works. Hmm? It's 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 a stair step progression that spirals back over time. I'm with you. You have sold me on it. Yeah, totally. It's fine. just it's their first exposure okay. to it, and he's literally saying, "This is the poison. Come up with this antidote. It's one to one, as opposed to the slughorn, which is a newt level class of you don't know what this poison is. Figure it out and come up with the antidote. It's much more complex at that point. I think that perfectly answers my question, in which case I think these lessons are perfectly appropriate and wonderful, except for the whole trying them out on kids things. But besides that... No, 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 that, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but Snape's off. Everything else is great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Anybody have another thought before we jump to one of mine? Anybody want to um, throw one out there? I was interested in... Because Winky was wearing, like, the clothes that were fitted for her. She wasn't taking care of them, but she had clothes... That fitted her perfectly so i was like who makes that like because there's not really a market for elf clothes because clothes don't elves don't get clothes unless they get freed it almost be like large scale doll clothes right i mean like because like mm. that that scale is odd like you're saying like it's it's not even like i guess maybe goblin clothes would be in the similar realm for creatures that similar. we know and for also yeah. being bipedal and all of these things. But, but have we seen any, like, female goblins, though? Because they were ladies' clothes. Like, it was a skirt we, and blouse. We haven't, but, mm -hmm. but I would assume they're all... Well, clothes don't have a gender, but, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm almost thinking it's, like, an elf Etsy store. <laughs> I like that. Like a... Like a some uh, homemaking wife who in her free time likes to make clothes and it does it as like a side job because you can't make it a full-time job right get a little bit of extra cash or something coming in and sure she hand makes clothes for elves so who have they, been unfortunately freed like she does it almost like a like a charity. a charity case like like a donor's choose or or a gofundme let's let's talk about wizarding clothing enterprises in full scale everything anyway i mean the only information we really have is uh the tailor that harry goes to in book one for robes madame malkins madame right mm -hmm. and as far as we know there isn't a, a target <laughs> for for wizarding robes there's there's not necessarily mass produced everything we've seen has been specifically tailored they take measurements. They do that. If Crouch is going out and getting clothes, which is what he says, this means clothes, he probably takes her to like Malkins or another wizarding tailor and gets her fitted for clothes. Like, I, I think it is, knowing Crouch, at least, that is not surprising to me. Hmm. I mean, like, there is Glad Rags wizard wear, though. So I'm assuming that Madame Malkins is like a specific tailoring thing. And maybe That's Glad true. Rags is more like a departmental store. That's kind okay. Of fashion All right. I, was, I wasn't thinking of Glad Rags. So I, yeah. I, I pulled it back a bit. But I still mm. think it holds true for Crouch's character that if I'm going to free my elf, it's still going to be very specific be on how it's like done. about it <laughs> right <laughs> that and if that's what he sent her off in it makes sense that it's a mess because she wouldn't take it off because her boss gave that to her and even though the giving of the clothes sets you free th this is from my master this is what mm. i'm wearing yeah mm -hmm. it's like when you meet like a famous person and shake their hand it's like i'm never washing this hand again like gross yes <laughs> it, yes it's it's mm. that same idea of this is how it is now. Mm. I will yeah, just that was just it. that was just bothering me because I'm like, there's no market for that. Yeah, no. it's it's certainly it's certainly probably uh, not. Very she's specific. probably you know it, well Dobby's just gonna take whatever he can get. We know that later oh, on he's just finding Dobby's everything. I, <laughs> I love it, but um, yeah, no, it's it's certainly questionable of the the market of. <laughs> house self clothing because someone's got to sell at least the tea cozies right so 
someone who's to fill that niche. Maybe Hermione's going to invest in that later on. You know? Oh, she would. Right? <laughs> How enterprising of her. <laughs> Melissa, what, what do you got next? All right. I want to talk about Fleur. Oh, yes. I like teenage Fleur. Me too. Right? I love her. Teenage teenagey Fleur who blasts Cedric with her Vilaism to try and get her, him to date her, and Fleur who's just off in the corner making out with Roger, and like just being a typical teenager. I like it. I, I mm-hmm. like the character. Right. Fast forward two and a half years, and she's all married and adulting and grown, and it's like. And that's what it feels like, because when I read this 20 years ago, when I was 20, so throw that out there, I, I like it made sense to me. I didn't it didn't even occur to me that that would be weird. But looking back as an adult reading through this, she literally grew up in two years. Hmm. She went from being a kid to being an adult in just two years. And it happened like that. And that's what happens when people hit that magic age between anywhere between like 16 and 20 or some kids are older, it might take them a little longer, but like there's, they just snap and flips and changes and she grew up, bam, you're an adult. And it's nice to kind of see that progression and how everybody, that's just what happens. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Random musings of Fleur. Yeah, I think it's, it was definitely pushed forward by the war too. With most of the teenagers, they had to grow up fast to survive. Yeah, so. exactly. And she mm-hmm. met Bill and Bill was older and she wanted to be with him and that's what it required. And yeah, I mean, he's no Roger. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, Luke. You're staring into space over there. What do you think? He's no well, Roger Davies. Yeah, Roger yes, Davies. He's no Roger. I was like, is that some, a reference to Marvel or something that you guys were chatting about before? I don't know who that is. Roger Rabbit. Yeah. Roger Rabbit. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I will. I will buy that. He is in fact not Roger Rabbit. That's. I think. I think I'm. I'm okay with that being canon. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. It's. It's nice to see Fleur be frustrating uh you know it she's she's a teenager and she's a popular teenager and it comes across that way and it's pretty well done of yeah she's she's better than everyone and she knows it she's also been validified and validated in that of yeah you're the the champion for bobaton and i like that it's kind of questionable on on how she's uh making choices and ron i mean come on ron what are you doing what are what are you doing I Poor took boy. a chance swing <laughs> swing in a at least a foul tip at, at best i guess it's more like he showed up to the wrong level of game yeah yeah dating dating is one of those sports that you, you kind of have to be at a similar level it's kind of like tennis oh, you can't you can't show up on a tennis court with somebody that knows what they're doing your first day and hang you can't just figure no. it out it's no it, you have to be at least in the realm of uh similar <laughs> ability and uh ron is essentially at a zero here uh, yeah. and runs into it's a, not negative an eight plus like just for experience level so do you reckon like later on once Flo was married to bill she'd like joke about how her brother-in-law once asked her out in the most embarrassing way possible <laughs> to like other family members did he really even get the words out though like <laughs> i think he just like freezes and it's just like the most awkward thing that she looks back and is like what was that like, <laughs> like yeah at christmas four years from now uh so i remember this no. one time what 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 was that what was that all about and ron won't tell her but jenny totally rats him out oh yeah yeah oh yeah as she should because it becomes a family joke because let's be honest let's say flirt never married bill Let's say Ron didn't get with Hermione, right? They meet 10 years later. She will still be out of his league. She won't remember the interaction. No. no. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. I just needed a Fleur moment. I love that girl. Moment with Fleur. I do too. Well, first of all, how about her like hanging with the boys in the champions thing as well? Like, mm-hmm. I don't think we give her enough credit for being the only female. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think Fleur gets a lot of flack and I'm wondering if like a lot of the way of how she was written was kind of like how English people make stereotypes about French people. Like there can, there seems to be a bit of that going on. Yeah. <laughs> and like, she's yeah. sort of, yeah, but she's really not given enough credit. She held her own in the tournaments. 
like in the movie that's kind of underplayed because Bobatons is seen as like an exclusively female school but mm-hmm. Bobatons in the books is both sexes it's male and female right. but Fleur is still the best choice for that school and I'm like yes <laughs> well, she's just real sad that she was the only female mm. but you know that's a whole that's a whole nother conversation for later and another time so all right do you have another thought from the first couple of chapters in this section <laughs> Oh, just a random thing. I like how Hagrid tries to nail the scroots into those cozy little bed boxes. <laughs> <laughs> it just made me think that if like if Hagrid could be one of those people that has like a chihuahua and a purse, but it's like a dragon in a purse, he would totally just walk around with a dangerous creature strapped yeah. in. <laughs> well, when we talked about this in our chapter on this one, we talked also about how he did the same thing to Norbert. Yes. <laughs> who was like ripping apart the stuffed animal he put in there and then the scroots with their like pillow lined hammered in boxes <laughs> like what else so i mean what else does hagrid have he's got fluffy the three-headed dog so what's mm-hmm. he gonna build a three-headed dog cage um we've got the thestrals so what kind of container can he build for them <laughs> <laughs> put fluffy in his handbag right like walk along yeah with yeah he could carry fluffy maybe like maybe he's a unit. or fang <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, I like the I like the idea of a dragon in a handbag though. That's <laughs> pretty funny. I want to talk about Percy next. Oh yeah. Um, so Percy being Mr. Crouch's stand-in, right? So both mm-hmm. at the Yule Ball and then as we continue on through like task two and so on. Did this happen because no one else at the ministry could be bothered to show up? Like, or is it that Voldemort didn't want to raise any suspicions that Crouch had been imperialized and was being left at home? And so was like, how do I fly this under the radar? I know, let's have him send, you know what I mean? Like, let's have him send his assistant, who just happened to be Percy, so that like it it, it arouses, it, it, I can't even talk, I'm sorry, that it gives the least amount of ministry involvement as necessary by getting the lowest level person to fill in. I don't know, it was more of a half-formed thought. Yeah, and I see where you're going. I like that theory about Voldemort sort of pulling the strings, like Emperor Palpatine, but I don't know. I think it was kind of more on Percy's behalf. I think Crouch stopped coming into work and started sending in his random letters to his second in command. And Percy's just like, you know what? I'm going to take the wheel because he's a bit power hungry and he sees an opportunity and goes for it. And he's like, you know, who's going to stop me? And I think a lot, of, a lot of other people in the ministry that might have been suitable to fulfill that role of Crouch just sort of didn't step in because it's like, oh, it's being handled, I guess. I don't know. Like he read the letter and um, and was supposed to go to the assistant or like the second in command. And instead of doing that, he was like, oh, Mr. Crouch told me mm-hmm. I would go. Ooh, I like that idea better. Okay. Yeah. I'm with you. Okay. Convinced. <laughs> Luke, how are you hanging over there? Yeah, I... I feel like Percy will go out of his way to put himself in the position to have the opportunity for something like that. And he's certainly not going to shy away from this thing when it comes up of like, hey, okay, he's going to be out. I'm just going to roll with it and take as much on as I can because he is very, very ambitious and it only looks good for him if he succeeds. So how do you succeed? Take on more. We'll see if he can handle it. Um, But I'm not surprised that Percy does it the way he does. And I I don't dislike the idea of him just like kind of interceding and putting himself in that position of he gets this letter and he's getting responses back from Crouch a little bit at least. So I'll just go with it and we'll just we'll just make it happen. Right. I'm not going to I'm not going to escalate this problem. I'm not going to elevate it to up the rung at all to say like there's something fishy because it's an opportunity for him to take the reins and make some choices whether or not they're good uh, i don't know but it's not surprising yeah percy's probably getting le- letters from like crouch and it's like oh magic carpets lemons all the dash. <laughs> and he's just like reading he's like a random scribble a picture of like a wizard's hat and he's like hmm <laughs> All right, here's the direction we're going. <laughs> like a board meeting. <laughs> lemons. <laughs> Fly garbage, lemons. He's like, Mr. Crouch is such a genius. <laughs> oh, this is 
this is everything I ever wanted for a first job. It's amazing. <laughs> he has the internship from hell. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> but he's so oh, happy man. to have the opportunity. <laughs> so, at the Yule Ball, do you think Dumbledore actually stumbled upon the room of requirement with the bathroom? I think so. Yeah, I think that's on brand for him. I think Here's that's on brand for him. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right on Alba's brand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I agree with you, but will you explain why? Well, his whole story about, oh, I was just, I needed to go to the bathroom and I was stumbling around around 5.30. I mean, Dumbledore's an old man. I can believe that that might happen in the early hours of the morning. And I don't think that he knew about the room of requirement. I think maybe in fifth year, when the DA started using it, he started to learn more about the room. But I don't think at that point he knew that it was a part of the Hogwarts layout. I literally didn't think it was the room of requirement. I didn't put those two things together for years yeah. Reading and rereading. It says it. Harry says it later on. He's like, I think Dumbledore, because when he's trying to figure out the place to go to. I know. Mm. I know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Doesn't matter. Harry figured it out and Melissa didn't. Nice. Ooh. Tell Abby. He gets Sick the burn. Point. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, did you notice at the Yule Ball, Dumbledore, I think it's at the Yule Ball, I don't know, somewhere in this section, Dumbledore conjured a plate of cakes. Did he? Mm -hmm. I don't know oh. where, but I wrote it down. <laughs> How? Luke, are you searching possibly? No? Sure. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Will you? Because I'm actually here's my problem. Book. Here's my problem. You mm -hmm. can't conjure food from nothing. It's one yeah, of some law. so's laws of something yeah. or up. There you go. Transfiguration. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Gaunt. Gamp. Gamp. Sorry. Gamp. 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 Something like that. So why did he? How how did he get the food? Are you sure he conjured it from thin air? Because maybe he just transported it from the kitchens. Like. Right. Yeah. I would assume it was a form of food apparition mm. which is similar to how the food works in the great hall in the first place yeah and i think in second book mcgonagall does something similar she has like the endless plate of sandwiches that she leaves out for harry and ron after they crash into the Womping willow like legends um so something like that but i don't i don't remember him conjuring the cakes oh no hold on it's not at the yule ball oh new information oh, it at hagrid's hut it's in hagrid's hut right so i'm flipping madly in my book here um if you're interested the word conjure is used 61 times in the series there you go oh, fun fact are you writing that down as possible trivia luke <laughs> no that would not be acceptable as trivia here we go so it is in the chapter rita skeeter scoop page 453 of my version mm -hmm. And it's right after Hermione runs without being out of breath. Um, <laughs> For I the feel first like that's time. important to note. Hey, Hermione climbed and, the stairs and she was winded. That's like every other time. <laughs> right. But she runs from Hogsmeade to Hagrid's hut. Not a problem. It's pure rage. Her, apparently she's there. a distance runner. <laughs> So here, here's the here's the paragraph. Morty, I think, said Dumbledore, closing the door behind Harry, Ron, and Hermione, drawing out his wand tw and twiddling it. A revolving tea tray appeared in midair along with a plate of cakes. Dumbledore magicked the tray onto the table and everyone, everybody sat down. Hmm. Where do the cakes come from? Well, it's, hmm. I would assume it's kind of a similar question of like Aguamenti, right? You know, you can conjure water to come out of seemingly nowhere, but it has to come from somewhere. So that, I mean, it, it has to. It, I mean, technically you could Aguamenti and what you're doing is pulling water molecules from the air around you. So I actually could see that one being. But it can also like, work for wine. Reasonable. You can spout wine from your wand. Yeah. Okay, that that just sounds like a great skill. Right. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna fight against that. <laughs> <laughs> that make that make the uh, drinks and nose podcast a lot easier. A lot. Easier. A lot I'm cheaper. Here. I'll say that. The Gamp's law thing makes my brain angry because it's like the exception is food, but food is a construct. Anything's food. Like I could pick up anything and eat it. Realistically. <laughs> Don't try that at heart. <laughs> <laughs> we do not support what Jem is talking about. Not everything is food. 
Uh, no, I, it's it's a it's just, it just depends on your effort level, is what she's saying. <laughs> I feel like I, mean, I need his thesis. You know what I mean? Like the his his laws of whatever. I I need to read it to be able to understand it. Yeah, well, there is no thesis. We just know what the exceptions to his rule are. We don't actually know what the rule is, which is frustrating. JK, I need answers. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm not kidding. I need the study. I need the research. I mm-hmm. need, God, I sound like a Ravenclaw. <laughs> it might be the most I need the receipts. I've said. <laughs> yeah, like, I need the plan. I need everything that goes along with it. The logistics of how this works. Yeah, the... Gamp's elemental laws of transfiguration has always been something where it obviously came in pretty late, right? It was introduced in book seven, right? That's mm. the first time we, or is it late book six that they talk about it? But I know That's it's it's seven, right? Because it's when they're it's it's the camping expedition. Yes. Yeah. And Hermione's like, we we, we learned this. It's like, oh, okay, I guess we did, but um, because <laughs> Harry and Ron don't pay attention, but um. It was always and everything, and Hermione's like the internet. Everything she says is true. <laughs> Sometimes, but um, <laughs> like it's funny. I'm, I feel like I'm complaining about something that I specifically do. I, I love thinking about the science and how the magic works. You know, I like to understand how it makes sense. And this is one of those where like you almost kill the magic by giving it rules. You know what I mean? Like it, it's almost like just leave it alone. Just let the magic be magic in this one. And don't open that door because it's just a lot of doors that you're opening and closing and it it confuses certain things like this offhand comment of I'm sure you can still justify it working, but there are certain things where just don't don't put a rule to it. <laughs> okay, I disagree. So oh, okay, go I'm ahead. Getting spicy. Um I disagree because if you don't put limitations on the magic, then it creates a lot more problems with how the story works because then you could be like, oh, why aren't wizards going and solving the problems everywhere true, and why true. are wizards poor and all this sort of stuff. If we can't can just, just generate food, food out of nowhere. Like we and, still have to have yeah. tension with those characters yeah. and things. So I, It still builds conflict. Yes. Mm. It just depends on how you present it, I guess, <laughs> is maybe my point of yeah. when the you introduce it as such a rigid tenant of magical theory it it can become kind of questionable at times and this is just one that i almost feel like more questions are raised than answered for this the the short-term benefit of ease of storytelling and ease of conflict you know what i mean like i I know that that's basically the trade-off of the rules allow you to tell a more tension grabbing exciting story but there are certain times where it's like well maybe don't make it sound so rigid and then give us nothing because you don't want to put in the work of figuring out how it's going to actually play out or have figured it out earlier right that's the other thing when it comes in in the last book you're like "Eh." because basically what happened was i found a mistake that doesn't go with something she created later yeah, this is a come on, JK. That's I think the crux of where I'm glad you put it that way, because if you read a like a, a story like um, Patrick Rothfuss, uh, Name of the Wind, it's mm-hmm. all about magical theory and like the rules are very deliberate and it's very well thought out. There are many things that are introduced later on that like this seems like a pretty fundamental magical thing that first, second, third year you're going to learn about. You can't just make food. You can't like you can do these things. That just seems like a basic thing. You would your uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're going to you're going to hit on those magical ways of dealing with the lower rungs on that first. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the way I would view it. So that's why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my biggest frustration with it is because it comes in so late and it just seems like a a CYA a, a cover your ass on. Wow, there's a lot of theories out there that this would just like why why is it so difficult? Oh, it's because there's this other thing that we didn't tell you about. Oh, that's because the curriculum didn't get there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not relevant to Harry's journey, so we don't actually He had house elves <laughs> doing all the work for him until now. Which is This is this, true. this is why this is why like Lord of the Rings is my favorite because all those things were figured out. Yeah. Or that's they just all. don't come up and they're just like, "Ah, we're just not going to worry about that." It's just it's just not a part of the story. <laughs> but but I am going to write seven different languages. Right. And invent um, Lembus yeah, bread. For all, of them. Sorry. Mm. all right. Next thoughts. Anyone want to sh- jump, throw one in? Hmm. What book how, do you want to like, 
how much do you think your best friend would have to change in appearance for you to not recognize them when you're standing like a foot away from them? <laughs> Referring to like Hermione at the Yule Ball. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty thick, isn't it? Like, yeah. Oh, and he sees, he sees her every day. <laughs> he sees Victor walking up and a girl he didn't recognize and the rest of them. Like, I get like in that portion where he sees like the group, he's not going to focus on every single person. It just kind of glances over and mm. just like, okay. Like, uh, miss whatever, you know, across the room. But then it's like, it's a little while before he's like, oh, that's Hermione. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah. Except, yeah. okay, I'm, I'm going to, I don't disagree with you. It's bad. But I taught hundreds of kids and I can't recognize most of them once they leave elementary school. Like, and, and granted, different scenario. But yeah, this was like, as soon as they're sorry, not with me afternoon. every day and they've, they've moved on and they're getting taller than me because they all get taller than me. And and they come back, they're like, Mrs. Crowley. And I'm like, hello, small adolescent person. <laughs> hi, hi, you. How are you? I'm supposed to know this person, right? No idea. So I, I can get it from that point of view. Granted, he saw her three hours before. So that's a little different. I, I'm not saying he's right. Here's my other argument in Harry's defense. Have you seen, and this is from several years ago, but it just popped up with me. Zoe Deschanel from The New yeah. Girl. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bangs, glasses. Take away the bangs and the glasses. Would you have any idea who she is? There's like whole memes on the internet of like her with and without and they're like it doesn't look the same person i would not recognize her and i wouldn't either because i'm not great with faces mm -hmm. so again not saying that harry shouldn't recognize his very best friend in the whole wide world when he saw her three hours ago i'm just saying i could see how being completely out of context of what he knows of his best friend seeing her a completely different way would take a minute to like oh that i'm supposed to relate what i see here to what i really know of you and there's also Mostly. that familiarity complex of if you see something that is different, like I, I see you every single day and you change one of the fundamental things about you that makes you the visual appearance of what you are, like it, the way our minds work to follow patterns and things like that, it, it's not surprising that like, oh, OK, I don't see that very familiar trait that creates the quick thought of, oh, that's Hermione. Especially in the glance, I guess it's it's not too yeah. surprising. I actually just realized that happened to me the other day. <laughs> so I've exposed myself. <laughs> My friend got like her hair dyed and we went to the movies together and I was talking to her and she walked away and I walked over to where she was and I saw her from behind. I'm like, who's that? And then she turned around I'm like, oh, right. Because <laughs> like one feature had changed about her and I just completely. So yeah, I've done the same. Wow. I played myself. <laughs> And we've come Good, full you circle. proved my point. <laughs> <laughs> so fair enough, Harry's valid. <laughs> now, if it had been Ron, I probably wouldn't be so forgiving. What? I don't know why. I, I, but, which is funnier because he's denser. I was going to say, it makes upset. more sense that he wouldn't. Except that he's got this like unknown weird obsession with her at this point. It's still Ron. So, okay, fine. <laughs> they both doesn't it say like... I didn't know it. I think the line in the book is that Ron was acting like he hadn't even seen her. So maybe he didn't see her. <laughs> know. Like, like didn't recognition see her. Yeah, didn't like, acknowledge that it was her. Yeah. But it could just be his jealousy being like, Max. I don't know. It could be both. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next thoughts? Anyone want to jump in? Nope. Take it away. All right. The Sleek Easy's Hair Potion Corporation. Mm -hmm. I want to know what structures are in place of the Potter family conglomerate. D do the funds and proceeds from this go to Harry's Gringotts vault? Does he still have a retain an ownership piece of the company? If so, is there like, like a, a management team? If not, are there stock business structures in the wizarding world? Go. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, from what I discovered about Fleamont Potter, he sold the company for an immense profit. That was from Wikipedia. So my assumption is that Harry isn't receiving any further royalties from the company brand. Uh, they simply got a bunch of money from selling the, the brand and they sort of kept that in their vault and it hasn't really been spent too much because it must have been like a lot of money. Okay. But yeah, that's that's my view. I'm terrible at business, so take it away. I, I, think, I think you're... <laughs> 
I think that's pretty much accurate. Um, we don't have a ton more other than that. Um, but yes, rights were sold off. And f if you don't know, Fleamont is James Potter's father. He founded the Sleek Easy Corporation. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of about it, though. They just have this residual windfall of cash that just is there. And uh, I would think that James and Lily weren't over overzealous with their spending, you know, and they Didn't also died young spend anything so. right they they died young and it seems like the potter grandparents died fairly young as well because they're clearly not around now so harry's not spending a ton he is fiscally responsible as far as we can tell because he chose not to get the gold plated cauldron <laughs> like he was wanting to which would be questionable for a cauldron he anyway for gold. lower melting point but um he's living within his means he is living within <laughs> his means at this point so I, I i think that's i think that's about it though yeah okay so i need to preface this next section for us and for all of our friends hanging out in the chat for those of you listening on the podcast we do live stream most of our episodes and we are live streaming as well so we are here with people who are hanging out in the chat thank you all of you for doing that I want to remind everybody that this is a family-friendly podcast, and we use family-friendly terms and vocabulary and topic discussions. So while my next question might take us down a road, we're not going down it. <laughs> we're going to keep it like low level, okay? Disney Here we level. go. Mm -hmm. So we are aware and of the tangents. Disney. We are avoiding the tangents mm -hmm. as uh, tastefully as possible. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, and and somebody in the chat just asked, even in the chat, and I'm going to say yes because I, because my six year old can get on YouTube, and if my six year old can get on YouTube, the ten and eleven year olds who are just discovering Harry Potter can't do. So I just mm -hmm. want to like throw that out there. Sorry, I sound like such a mom. Okay, here we especially go. if you're coming over from the Drinks and Nose podcast, uh, very right. very different. <laughs> <laughs> very different. So I'm 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 laying it out there very blatantly. Human giant relationships, based on what we know of, and I'm going to say it wrong, Grop. Grop, yeah. From book five, yes. Do giants have the communication, comprehension, emotional space to be in a relationship with a human? I'm specifically ta talking on like an emotional, intellectual, like consent level love, kind of deal. Loves type level, yeah. not a um, anything else that that okay. could entail. Well, from what we find out, it doesn't seem that way. Uh, it seems like giants have a way of communicating with humans, but it's quite limited. But then again, there's always black sheep. So, I mean, all the house elves seem one way, but Dobby's quite different. So maybe Frid Wolfer was a bit of an outlier and was able to express herself more humanly. Let's put it that way. Okay. And maybe, seeing as how Hagrid has such a positive connection with a variety of beasts, and I don't mean in any kind of like relationship way, but he just yeah. understands them, maybe his dad had some of that as well, that sense of being able to be more empathetic towards other beings, and that mm -hmm. led him more open to being in a relationship with a non-human, potentially? Yeah, I can definitely say that. Yeah, there there are a lot of questions here. Um, on Beast First Beings and all of those questions, read Fantastic Beasts. It's a wonderful auxiliary book to the series that we'll get to after this book, I believe. Uh, the original, yeah. not to do with actual Newt's Commander, the movie series at all. No. Um, but or the, the updated version, um, the updated audiobook version read by Eddie, Eddie Redmayne, Redmayne even. It's not even that. It's mm -hmm. original. Correct. But there is good discussion on beasts versus beings, and it opens up the question of, you know, is, I mean, what other interspecies relationships are out there? You know, at mer people, at house they elves, were. goblins, centaurs. I mean, where, centaurs, that it opens up a lot of uh, dirty areas that we're going to avoid. But I just want to bring that question to it and reference it. But yeah, it's once you open the door a little bit, it, it yeah, 
Like mm-hmm. I even believe, like it's it's not even, and I know it's not direct text canon, but it's out there. Flitwick has goblin blood, mm-hmm. you know, and so we have characters of varying interspecies mingling, and it just interests me on a an emotional relationship level. How does that? work i mean i can i can almost see a goblin human right your outlier goblin because they are more cognizant yeah or even an outlier human i mean that sure right sure i'm sure there are definitely humans that would relate probably better with goblins than other humans yes. that is certainly out there but the giant one throws me a bit uh, yeah. well there's more about than one way of communicating too i mean there's legitimacy so Perhaps there was a connection through that option, and there's plenty of magical ways that two people of different species could have connected, I think. And there are certain, I mean, there are plenty of examples of very successful relationships between people who don't speak the same language at all, you know? It, that's true. That's very prevalent across many, many cultures, so I don't think that's too far out of the question. You just make it work. If it's there, it's there, and uh, it, I think it can make sense. Okay. Any other thoughts on the human-giant relations? Not that we can get to here, but maybe a follow-up on <laughs> podcast night and three quarters. <laughs> oh, we've touched on this subject before. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Mm, speculation time. Mm-hmm. What would have happened if Harry hadn't fallen into the trick step in the chapter The Egg and the Eye? So let's say he didn't fall into the trick step and he caught fake Moody in Snape's office. I think Moody would probably, Moody would probably have mm-hmm. obliviated him. Mm. But that might have caused a bit of problems because Harry mightn't have remembered what he'd learned that night with the egg and then been confused about what had gone on. And so he might have figured it out later on okay. that something had gone wrong. Because mm. Moody can't kill Harry or capture him yet. Can't he? Gotta wait for the right moment. Can't he? <sighs> I have fundamental problems with the whole idea of book four, to be completely fair, of like, just off him. Just kill him. Just kill Harry. You're done. Like, just bring the body to, to Voldemort. That's it. That That's much simpler than this convoluted... Put him in, like, a like, big sack over yeah. your shoulder. Take him. <laughs> Make, like, a, a, a box of a stick Who? and then get, like, a golden object inside. So Harry goes crawling in. There, there are, there are two it. characters that could easily walk around Hogwarts with a gigantic sack on their shoulder and have no questions asked. Hagrid and Moody. They could just get away with it, being like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, that's what they would be doing right now. They would be walking around with a giant person-sized bag over their shoulder. Let's get to Hog... They're taking it to Hogsmeade. They're going to go have a drink. It's fine. Like, no one's going to question that. And if they did... Help! Like, <laughs> no, he's Why dead. You? He's dead already. I'm, I'm saying that he's carrying the corpse. He's just carrying Harry's oh. body. <laughs> Harry's gone. He's dead already. <laughs> Because he doesn't have to be alive yeah. to, to get the blood for the, the potion later on, right? You just, just going to have the blood. Well, you know what the answer to that is, Luke, right? Narrative. Plot armor. Yeah. Yeah. Harry Potter is Jon Snow. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Luke Skywalker. It's classic. Yeah. And Jenny. Frodo Baggins. It's a little different than Frodo. A little bit different. But yeah. a little bit different, which is why I like Frodo the least. Yeah. <gasps> I love Frodo. <laughs> oh, Lord of the Rings. My all-time favorite book. Frodo? Not my fave. He's so ordinary, though. That's why I love him. <laughs> I like Fatty Bulger. Big miss. Big miss from the, from the movie on that. I like Mary. And Sam. And Pippin. But Mary. And Freddy. And I basically like all of the hobbits that end up growing and changing and doing something. Instead of being just sort of dragging along and being dragged by the people who are there with him. Anyway. But to answer your question <laughs> of, of what would happen if Harry showed up in Snape's office where, where Moody was there, I, I feel like Moody Barty Crouch Jr. would have somehow sweet talked his way out of it because Harry trusts mm. Moody. If, if I mean, unless well, Harry literally had, has the map up, it was like Crouch Moody. <laughs> Crouch yeah. Moody. <laughs> which I, I don't think he would, he would do that because he would get there and put the map away is the way I would see it. And so then there's that just distance time enough mm. that Moody could somehow warp it and make it yeah. work for his narrative that he is putting Harry through this year because he's the puppet master this year, not well, just you know, Dumbledore. 
And you know, as soon as Harry shows up, people are like, oh, I thought I was going to see Mr. Crouch. Oh, you thought you were going to see Mr. Crouch? Well, I heard some noise in here. Yeah, he must have skedaddled. Yeah, like, here, let me spin that story for you. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So, so I have a vote for Harry in a sack and a vote for spin it to keep the narrative. Yeah. I definitely okay. think it would be the manipulation vote that he would spin it to be like, oh, you know, Mr. Crouch was here and I scared him off. And Harry's like, oh, but let's go find him on the map. And Moody's like, what map? And snatches it. It's like, oh, I'll take this Show for me. a while. <laughs> That looks good. Thanks. <laughs> and at the end of the day, there is no scenario where Moody doesn't end up with the map. He always has to. Absolutely. Mm. And right along with that, like, again, I really fundamentally think Harry should not have put the invisibility cloak back on him. He can get stuck in the stair. He can drop the egg and cause a commotion and have Filch come out of the woodwork to find him and, and all of this stuff. But Harry has every right to be out there right now. Plus, he's Harry freaking Potter. He's going to get away with it. School champion. He, what, what's going to happen? Oh, I'm going to I'm going to tell your head of house that you were out walking around with your egg. OK, that's like my prerogative. Like that's specifically what I'm supposed to be doing. The fact that he mm. hides himself is the only reason this becomes a tension building scene that we can get this interaction between Moody and Snape. That's the only reason. But Harry would easily have gotten away with it. Yeah, he would have. Or if he had used his newly acquired skill of yeah. Accio and it's... had him return his own items to himself using the spell to return things to himself that he just learned. Instead of doing the most muggly thing of, here's my wand, oh, no. I need that I... thing, I'm going to try to reach with my magical implement tool <laughs> to try to reach the thing as opposed to just be like, hey, that's the thing I want, got it. <laughs> In defense of Harry, I mean, same. <laughs> when I panic, I just go to my, like, my monkey brain takes over and I'm like, oh, I'm going to like <laughs> do things in the most silly way I can but, before a minute later I'm like, oh, I should have just... Oh. But like we've seen over and over again that panic mode is like Harry's go-to. Like that's where he shines. That's where I think to me it's most surprising of anytime there is that panic mode, that's where he becomes front and center super hairy, right? I mean, for lack of a better term, that's that's his element. And so, I don't know. Maybe it's just because, I don't know. We expect more from Harry. I expect more from Harry in this specific situation. Harry. I like when Harry doesn't, when Harry just makes mistakes and is human. I, I like those yeah. moments, which is why book five is my favorite. Yeah, no, yes. it's, it makes it a good story for sure. All right, I only have one more thought. Here we go. So I had this idea when we discussed chapter 25 on the idea of that stairwell being a circle of power and that Mrs. Norris had power over Harry because right, right. he could smell him and he was kind of trapped in. Um, Filch has power over Mrs. Norris because, you know, owner. But Snape has power over Filch, that Snape trumps Filch every single time. And Moody was trumping Snape. Moody had power over Snape. And it was very much this game of rock, paper, scissors where Moody was winning. Yeah. But what I couldn't say when we recorded chapter 25, because those were spoiler free, is that Harry had power over Moody because of the map. Mm -hmm. Because of his knowledge of the real name on the map, even though... Mm -hmm. He didn't know that was Moody's name. By saying that, he then had power over Moody, which meant that Harry could kind of get what he wanted in that had he realized the power he held. Well, yeah, that's if, if you're walking around with a guilty conscience, right? You're hiding something specifically and someone has like, hey, here's the answer. And you realize that, but know that they don't know it yet. Yeah, no, you're going to do you're you're at their will at that point to not create a worse problem for yourself, right? So that's where Harry has that power over him. But Harry's being oblivious to it is the only thing that Moody can rely on and try to double down on setting the tone for what and who Crouch used to be. Also, Harry has the wrong Crouch in mind, so Moody will only play up to that and not even breach the subject of there's another Moody at play here or another Crouch at play here. So certainly Harry has the opportunity to have the power, but he truly doesn't yet, right? Without, he has a step, he has, he has a key to unlock the yeah. door of power in that relationship, but he's nowhere near actually being able to use it yet. No. Hmm. Like, it begs the more philosophical question of, do you have power if you don't know you have power? Or right. Not. I think so. Hmm. And I don't remember where I was listening to this. The idea that, 
babies have power. It. That's that's the last chapter of It that we just did. There it is. Thank you. Babies have power because if they cry, parents in general and like normal situations, right? Like there's outliers, but yeah, parents then respond and babies learn. Oh, if I cry, they're going to feed me. They're going to change me. They're going to play with me. Toddlers have power. They have no idea, but toddlers have immense amounts of power because yeah, like they're balls of insanity. We can walk and talk and scream and throw things. So yes, I do think you have our, but I think it's once you become aware of it and you're four and you know how to manipulate your parents, like that's what it becomes. That was all day in my life today. Um, Ooh, it's I'm telling you real life for six is great. <laughs> older, older is fine too, but like elementary school, that's where it like really evens mm-hmm. out. But when, it's when you can manipulate the situation with your power, that's where it becomes like Spider-Man. With great power. Yes. <laughs> Which four-year-olds won't do. No. Sorry, Luke. We'll get there. Okay. All right. That is all of my notes. Hmm. I had like one other thought that was bugging me about the egg, how the clue relies on you having to put it underwater. In the mm-hmm. movie, they show the egg as like they have a glass sort of case inside the egg and it's got bubbles in it. Even when they open it on land, you see the bubbles inside. So that's kind of a clue that you could put it underwater. But in the book, mm-hmm. there's nothing like that. <laughs> So my question is like, what would make you think, oh, I have a golden egg clue. I should put it underwater. How would you make that leap to try and solve the egg clue? Mm. That was something that we kind of chatted about last chapter, right? And because we were Mm. talking about the bath and putting it underwater. And yeah, it's, I know I I always really liked the way the clue is because it's something that it's one of those in crowd kind of things. If you have the knowledge of, wow, okay, mermish is a thing. Like starting from that, it's a thing. And it sounds potentially like exposure at all is going to basically give you the answer here. And but without that, you're not going to just happenstance across the answer, right? You're not going to just work out the clue. You're going to have well, to have some pre-existing knowledge to even have a chance to do it without accidentally dropping it in water and having it open up. Like that's not going to be something you're naturally going to think of doing, at least to me. But I'm going to go with WWHD. What would Hermione do? <laughs> so let's assume Hermione, as a fellow fourth year, wouldn't know about Mermish. Mm-hmm. I mean, Hermione probably knows it's Hermione, but let's pretend that a smart kid, but still doesn't have that exposure. What do you, what information do you have from the egg? You know it's an egg, and you know there's sound. Mm. Let's try to dampen you know. the sound. Well, I wouldn't dampen the sound. I try to identify the sound. What else sounds like that? And I would have to go to like a listening library and just go through sounds, almost like like a Google search engine for sounds. How would I isolate something that sounds like this? Right, but they don't really have that. Remotely similar. No, they don't necessarily. But that, like, that's how you start. Yeah. How does the sound? So then if you can relate that to, I mean, and you could start looking, what is the sound a dragon makes? What is the sound? A, I don't even know. An augury makes. What is a sound? The sure. Right. The bow truck, all, all of those things. Yeah. Go through fantastic beasts. Let's look through them all. We got it from a dragon, right? Maybe the next one's a beast. So maybe I start looking through there. What sounds do they make? Mm-hmm. Maybe in fantastic beasts, it says mer people can't communicate above water. Huh? I mean, it's got to be somewhere. It's mm. the clues are designed to be solvable. I also yeah. go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. It just seems real difficult. Like, yeah, you're right. You've got the sound part, but you could have just focused on the egg part. So you could have been like, all right, egg, because it was in a dragon's nest. But maybe that's another clue for like something else that lays an egg. So you go looking for creatures that lay eggs, and then you go down the yeah. rabbit hole. But I'm just curious if like, because Cedric, I think it's implied that Cedric figured it out in the prefix bathroom. Yeah, because Myrtle was there. So we're guessing that I guess he just had it on him at the time. But, but I Fleur think- and Crumb, we don't know how they figured that out. How they made that well, leap. I think we are told later on that fake Moody told Cedric about the water. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. So mm. at least that's there. And I know we saw Victor dive off the side of the boat into yeah. the cold lake water. And Harry's like, what's he doing going swimming? It's freaking cold outside. Mm. But, he was oh. prepped. He knew by then. Exactly. My assumption is, I mean, they've got grownups helping him, them, Fleur and yeah. Crumb. They, their teachers are blatantly helping them. I assume it's something along those lines. Mm. Yeah. I, Probably. So whenever I just offhand mentioned, like, you would want to dampen the sound. Like, that's where it starts opening up to me of, 
well, that maybe that isn't too far off on, okay, well, how do you dam it sound? Like, throw it in some, you know, cover it with a pillow. See if you get anything out of it okay. there. You know, wrap it up in some covers. Do anything. Throw it in water. I mean, because you can hear, you know, when you have that sound of, like, when you're underwater yeah. and you can hear something, it, it's certainly much, much quieter for what you're hearing, even if it's incredibly, incredibly loud. But, it, I don't know. There could be a natural progression of figuring it out that way. Um, but yeah, it's also looking at, this is supposed to be 17 and 18 year olds doing this. Newt level classes have finished all of their other magical creatures classes if they took that elective, which they might not have, right? They could easily have opted out and would have no chance at this without help. Um, so, I mean, maybe even, which it's surprising that the magical creatures classes never touch on more people. That seems like a really, really easy field trip which is not really a field trip because they are literally out in the in the grounds every time. They might in newt level, which we don't which, see. That's because our friends all exactly. drop out. Yes, yep, you're right. Harry doesn't take it, and that's like a whole thing. You're very correct. And so that would be a perfect newt level mm -hmm. reacher, right? But devil's so, advocate. I won't think that the mer people are kind of like centaurs, where it's like we're not creatures to be studied for your amusement. <laughs> like they have their own culture and civilization, and they might not want to be treated like objects. So the the only again difference I'll bring up is magical creatures is different than beasts versus beings. You can be a magical creature. Wizards are magical creatures, mm. technically. I would I would say they are beings, but they are still magical creatures. They are creatures that are magically innate uh or imbibed and so I, I think there's a distinction there as opposed to calling centaurs beasts which i believe they actually choose to be beasts because they don't they want request their yeah. beast status so 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 did her people okay I, I was gonna say i know i know it's mentioned and then i haven't it, it's all in the in like the introduction to that book there's <laughs> Mer people, centaurs, and unicorns have asterisks by their name. Unicorns? In their yes, they have asterisks by their name because the first two are they they were granted being status but requested to remain beasts so that they could stay out of the um like they didn't want any part of the human like government oh, government side yeah. Unicorns are there because they're so precious that. Like it's it's almost like giving them a um endangered species listing. Gotcha. That's kind yeah. of what it's there, is that because they are so it is such a thing, like in book one with with killing a unicorn and we can only do certain things with unicorns that we can't do with that, you know, that it's I don't know, not as big a deal with whatever. But because unicorns are so specifically protected, we need to make sure everybody knows that. So the asterisks didn't mean the same thing for each one, but those are the three that are like distinctly called out in the book. I maybe listened to the audiobook of that while I was driving a lot. Oh, it's so good. Please, ago. please listen to that. Eddie Redmayne does a wonderful job being mm -hmm. Newt's commander, and I love the Fantastic Beasts book in general. Also, uh, Andrew Lincoln did the Quidditch to the Ages. Check that one uh -huh. out as well. Very, very good stuff. Mm -hmm. Nice. I will check those out. I haven't listened to them. <laughs> yeah, they're they good. They are fantastic. And they just came out, both of them, last year, I believe. So, um, Also, A History of Magic, read by Natalie Dormer. Yes. I love her. Yeah. <laughs> no, that one is that one's awesome. That one's very good. It goes right along with the uh, art exposition that the History of Magic... Uh, things that yeah. were in London and New York this past summer as well. So those are very, very cool. Nice. Uh, Melissa, right, there was one last thing that I was just thinking about that you referenced in our last chapter about the three challenges that we have, the three tournament uh, challenges. And Ooh, yes, you want to take Go it ahead. away? No, because yeah. I don't know where you're going with it, but I, I know what you're talking about. So the three Triwizard challenges we have, the first one, it's dragons. It's fire. Second one is under the lake. It's water. I know. So Melissa had the, she, I don't know, first time had the idea that, okay, maybe there's an elemental thing involved in the three challenges that we have. So obviously we know it's a maze. It's kind of like earth, but it's also an amalgamation of all these other things that a maze can provide. So I wanted to get your thoughts, Jem, on what do you, do you think that was intentional to be like, oh, we have to have like an earth, wind, and fire like kind of uh, vibe to it? 
Um, I really like the theory on terms of symbolism level, but I don't think that's how it happened. I mean, you could look at it as it's still encapsulating all four elements in a three uh, challenge thing because dragons are fire and air. Um, but I don't think that that was the case because it's a triwizard tournament, there's four elements, it just doesn't line up neatly. Um, yeah, basically those are my thoughts, but I do like the idea, I think it's fun. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, that's really all I had. Melissa, you got anything else uh, along those lines? I don't, I mean, I can see how dragons could be air, but I think fire, water, earth, mm -hmm. because they literally grow the maze yeah. out of the ground. I don't know if air is blatantly used. I just wonder if JK planned that, like thinking through those different kinds of elementals or if it just worked out that way and i'm reading way too far into it mm, i don't know if it was planned like in that specific way i don't know <laughs> and that's all i got <laughs> yeah that's all i got <laughs> yeah that's all i got i'm glad that we didn't bring up ghosts <laughs> we can talk about ghosts you want to talk about ghosts <laughs> <laughs> who's your favorite ghost here we go um the headless hunt guys oh yeah yeah good call <laughs> because because <laughs> i think they're just so happy about being dead <laughs> Like, they're not somber about it at all. They're just juggling heads and riding around and being a nuisance. How do so, you even yeah. become a ghost if you're that happy about it? <laughs> this is why ghosts drive me insane. <laughs> what? Okay, this is the important question. What is your feeling about peeves? Look, I know you love peeves. <laughs> I do. I do love peeves. I, I love the idea of peeves. I, I, I don't know why I'm like this, but I've always been such like a goody two shoes. I hate it when rules are broken and chaos is reigned. So I'm not a huge fan of peeves. I think if I went to the school, I'd be so annoyed at all peeves antics. Um, so yeah, not a fan. <laughs> He's fine. He can do what he needs to do, but I'm not into it. Okay. What's worse, peeves or ghosts? <sighs> <laughs> Both. I don't really think. I mean, much I hate words. ghosts for how they break my brain. <laughs> But peeves, I would just be more annoyed on a nuisance level. So I guess ghosts make me more uprighteously annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like the answer. Luke, want to close us out? Yeah. So <clears throat> we will go ahead and lock back up the unrestricted section for another five or six weeks. And we'll have I don't know, maybe another special guest from Australia joining us at that time, who someone here may know pretty well. Um, so we look forward to having that person join us as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Jem. Uh, tell everyone where people can find you and just how cool you are. Oh, okay. Well, you can find us on Acast, Podbay, iTunes. I'm also on Twitter at Jem underscore just Jem. And yeah, give us a listen if you're 18 or over. <laughs> 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 Definitely do. Podcast nine and three quarters is is my one of my go tos for sure. Uh, I don't get too many chances to dive deep into magical theory, and you guys have certainly brought up many many really good questions and went in different directions than I really would have. So I highly highly recommend your show, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. All right. That wraps us up for this time. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you at the next unrestricted section. Goodbye. Bye.